believe you this morning.
memory hymn this morning is a hymn we learned uh, several months ago as a congregation, How Great Is Our God, hymn number five. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the music this morning. It lifts our hearts up. Our hearts are lifted up to you, Lord. Bless our meeting here this morning. Lift our spirits. Bless our tithes and offerings. And bless Pastor Paul as he leads. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
Thank you, Joellen. You think about what happens on Sunday morning, and we forget that it takes a lot of people doing a lot of work. We have Sunday school, and there are uh, scores of folks working, preparing for that, and then we have our choir. We have Christopher with his planning, the accompanists, the people back in the AV booth, so it takes a lot to get all this done. I'm going to brag on our choir because... um, Last week, uh, we were with Joellen's parents, and we always like to uh, go to church with them. At the, it's the church we were married in, uh, Calvary United Methodist Church there in Nashville. And so uh, her parents have belonged there since 67 or 8 or something like that. I mean, they've been there a long time, you know. So, But they sing in the choir. So um, they always have the, the choir special. Uh, there at the house, and so we have a little choir rehearsal on Saturday night, getting ready for Sunday morning. So our son John had driven up from Chattanooga, and so we got up there in the choir, and there were six men, and two of them were visitors. So I thought we're doing pretty well, you know, our choir because uh, they have a con- they have two services, and the congregation uh, maybe better I don't know four or five hundred there that Sunday morning, and. Uh, they had four of their men, two of us, six, and so I, the choir, yeah. So appreciate everyone being a part of that. And um, come and join. They, they have a great time. Romans chapter 8, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8 between now and uh, the end of the year. At times we're going to be dropping in and out. Uh, it's... Uh, Romans is the center of the New Testament, and Romans 8 is the center of Romans. So Romans 8 is the center of the New Testament. We're going to be starting with verse 12. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons, you could translate it children, of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit of self bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us that we might take this important lesson that we have from the book of Romans and to truly apply it to our lives and let it be, Heavenly Father, the lens by which we look through the events of life. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's a Native American legend that tells of how an Indian brave found an eagle egg. Don't know how it got separated from the nest, but there was an eagle egg, and so he put it in the nest of a prairie chicken. And if you know what a prairie chicken is, it's kind of like a rough grouse that we have here in the east. It's kind of that same category of bird, and it is hunted. So this this eagle is hatched, this eaglet, and it imitates what all the other prairie chickens are doing, scratching in the dirt, looking for seeds, and going after insects. And one day the eagle looked up and it saw another eagle just circling around, soaring so high. And he said to one of his... uh, Uh, prairie chicken friends what is that beautiful bird and the neighbor said it's an eagle the king of the birds but don't give it a second thought you could never be like him and so as a result that eagle died thinking it was a prairie chicken and I love that legend because it reminds us that there is within each of us so much potential that God has put in us, potential to serve his kingdom, 
the potential to soar above the challenges of this life. And yet so many times we live on this earth, in the flesh, and we never ever find the exhilaration and the joy that we could have. So today as we look at Romans chapter 8, we're looking at this very important passage that I've entitled the sermon, Abba Father. Abba is a Hebrew slash Aramaic word for daddy. It's not just if it's actually in the Hebrew, if it's Av, it, it's father. But if it's Abba, it's daddy. And so then father is the Greek translation so that then people who are reading the New Testament in the time in which Paul had written it would know, oh, what is Abba? It means father or it means daddy. Do you have that type of close, intimate relationship with the father? That's the question I want to start out with today. We have many questions in the sermon as you look in the outline. And I want to start out with a very important affirmation. We are debtors to Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Who is we? We is everybody, but it specifically is making reference to people who are saved. Whether people are saved or not, they are debtors to Christ because Christ has paid that price for their sins. We believe very clearly what the Bible says, that Christ died for the sins of all men, all people, not just the ones who believe in Him or trust in Him. He died so that all, whosoever will, could come to Christ. But particularly here, the Apostle Paul wants to point out that Christians need to be serving the Spirit of God and serving Christ and not serving the flesh. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh you will die. And he's talking about spiritual death there. We need to realize that none of us can live for themselves. You are either living for God or you are living for self and Satan. There's no sitting on the fence. There's no third option. There's no gray area. We live in a world where everyone wants to live in the gray area, but life is not like that. When it comes to whether we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, there's no in-between options. In Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, starting verse 14, is talking about why Christ came and how he's bringing us to glory. In so much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he gives his aid to the seed of Abraham. And the seed of Abraham is not talking about people who are Jewish in heritage or by DNA. It is talking about how we all can be a part of the seed of Abraham and the lineage of Abraham by trusting and believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Christ came in flesh and blood in order that he might conquer death so no longer we have to fear death. I had someone ask me today, or asked me the other day, they said, um, uh, are, you, are you afraid of dying? There's nothing to be afraid of dying. I said, well, if you know where you're going, you don't have to be scared of death, but the way you die, yes, that could be scary. I've seen a lot of scary, painful ways that people have died, but death itself and what happens after death, we as Christians no longer have to be in bondage to that fear. Did you know that there are people in other world religions that they go through all sorts of ceremonies and sacrifices and they put incense on altars and what they're hoping 
is that somehow in their lives there's going to be more good things than bad things and they can have eternal salvation. It is a religion of works. There are so many people living in that way. And what we need to realize is that if we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we know where we're going. We know where our destination is. We know that we're going to be with God forever and ever and ever. Amen. And so we don't have that worry. Our concern is, are we making the most of the time that we have right now here on earth? So that leads to my first question. What choices are you making? What choices are you making? Apostle Paul is very clear in Romans chapter 8 that we need to be sure that we're living according to the Spirit and not living according to the flesh. We live in a world that is more and more concerned about self-gratification. We live in a world that is driven by, if it feels good, do it. The problem with that way of living is that just because something feels good doesn't mean that it's good for you. There are lots of activities that feel good, but they're bad for you. So you can eat too much pizza. I'm amazed at the power of advertising. Because, uh, you know, I can have this nice dinner that Joel has fixed for me, and we sit down and we watch TV. Maybe we're watching uh, football, or last night we were going between World Series and football. And, uh, you know, that previous button is really handy there, you know, on the remote. You know, and so you're trying to skip the commercials, but, you know, they've got, they've got this... They got this great sandwich that's out, this uh, Parmesan pepperoni uh, chicken sandwich at Arby's, you know, and I've had one of those, and every time I see it, comes, you need to go buy one of those. Those things are great, you know, and I'm even thinking, man, I may want to go out and get one, even though I've had this great dinner, and then they show these pizzas, and you're getting hungry now, so you're going, what? And so it's amazing the power of advertisement to make us think we need something when we really don't need it at all. So we can be eating too much pizza, buying too many clothes, staying up late at night, the list goes on and on. Maybe it feels good at the moment, but it's really bad for us. And then people, of course, as I've already mentioned, they live a life of works. And there are Christians like that. They're going through life thinking that God's love can be bought or earned. Think about that. Now, many of our human relationships are like that. They're conditional. You know, if you win so many football games, you get to keep your job. You know, if you uh, produce uh, so many items in the factory, you get to keep your job. If your students make certain grades on a crazy test, then you get to keep your job. You know, we have all these, these standards. And then... You know, let's get into the bosses that don't like you so they don't evaluate you the way you, you know, the work or the quality you're really doing. And so there's, there's, there's people, and some of them may be here this morning, they're thinking, if I just do enough good things, God will really love me. God loves you, okay? He died on the cross for you. He sent his son down the cross for you. And there's nothing that you can do to keep him from not loving you. He loves you. He cares about you. And so that is why we send out missionaries to witness to Jews and to witness to Muslim and to witness to Hindus. It's because they are caught under this, this aura of you can just do so many works and God will love you and you'll have salvation. Everything we do as a Christian ought to be born out of the fact that God loves us and we want to please him. When we sin and we're in touch with God, we immediately realize, I have displeased God. I, maybe I can rationalize it. Maybe I can come up with excuses. But really, I know deep down, God is just like, oh, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did that. And his heartache becomes your heartache. That's when we really have that Abba Father relationship. So... What we have to do is we have to realize that we need to make every conscious effort that we can to extinguish the sin that is in our lives. And it's, 
you know, you go up to Gatlinburg and you still see the impact of the fires. And think about the fires that we had around here and how you can have a fire more or less contained under control, but then a big wind comes and those embers are pushed over to another ridge and all of a sudden the fire starts again. My friends, that's the way sin is. If you don't completely dampen it out, Satan is going to come along and blow those embers to another part of your life, and then you're going to have another fire again. And that's really what our lives are. We're trying to extinguish, keep the embers of sin as put out as much as possible. In John chapter 3, Jesus talks about this, this whole process of trying to deal with sin in our lives. Starting in verse 20, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. People don't jump up and say, Hey, look what I did. I committed adultery. Hey, look what I did. I lied. Hey, look what I did. I cheated. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Been done in God been done for God, been done to show God we love Him. So, so that question is there. What are you doing in your life? Are you making the right choices? Then are you led by God's Spirit? As we look again at Romans chapter 8, Apostle Paul says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. But you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. There's this whole process that that the Bible talks about adoption. That's when we become saved. Yes, we're made in God's image. Yes, we need to be soaring like eagles. But only as we have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and allowed that spirit to fill us, can we know that intimacy with God. Now we as Baptists are afraid of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. We're afraid of for two reasons. This isn't in the notes. This is extra. No extra charge for this, okay? Sometimes we're afraid of the Spirit because we're thinking, oh, if you get the Spirit, you start jumping up and running around and start jumping over the chairs and stuff like that. And that doesn't prove that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know what it proves, but it doesn't prove that. It might, but it doesn't all the time. The other thing is, when the Spirit gets a hold of us, we start feeling uncomfortable with our sin. We start feeling uncomfortable with our choices. We, we start to want to make sacrifice, do things for God we didn't want to do. And we're kind of going, what's happening? What's happening? It's because we're getting filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul talks about it quite clearly in his letter to the Ephesians. Now, I've got two different passages I want us to look at. In the fourth chapter, verse 30, And you do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And a partial obedience is a total disobedience, right? Right? Oh, well, you know, I gave 5% to the church. We're supposed to give 10. So we appreciate the 5, just need to double it. Well, I sing in the choir, but he also wants to teach Sunday school or come out in visitation. Witness to your neighbor. And then in chapter 5, The Apostle Paul points out the difference that occurs. And you see again, just as we saw in John's Gospel, this imagery of darkness and light, we see it here. For you were once darkness. Now, you know, now notice this. He says, he didn't say you were once in the darkness. He's saying you were the darkness. You were the darkness. And when we live our lives according to sin and to self and to Satan, we're darkness. Why? Preacher, that's so extreme. Well, it's the Bible. But number two, let me give you an explanation. If we're not doing something for God, it means we're doing something for Satan. 
when we are not being the outgoing Christians we need to be, there's someone who's not receiving a witness. When we're not sending out missionaries, we're not touching the ends of the earth with God's word. We only got so much time on this earth. I was never a crammer when I was in school. I always tried, you know, I worked things out and had a schedule and everything. And I'd see people, they'd be cramming and everything. Well, you know what? There's a reason they call it cramming. Because you've got a short amount of time and you're trying to get all this stuff, you know, right in there, you know? If we could live our lives with obedience to God, we're not cramming. We're just walking the Christian life and we're no longer darkness. For you were once darkness, but now you are not in the light. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Wow. Great verses there. I mean, there's a whole sermon there, but I won't preach it today. Last question. Are you suffering for Christ? When we go back to the book of Romans, he talks about how the Spirit of self bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In other words, we, we know. I don't, ever, I don't ever want someone to question whether they are saved. If they... They need to know that they're saved. You need to have that assurance. So let me tell you something. Right after you get baptized, Satan tries to tell you, oh, you know, you didn't really mean it. You didn't really understand. But you need to know. And, the, and God's Spirit will witness to you that you are one of His children. If you're a child, then an heir. And an heir is someone who inherits, right? And so we're adopted into the kingdom of God. Well, that means that Christ is our brother in the Lord. That's why it says heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. But there is a condition here. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Glorification occurs when we get to heaven and we experience our salvation face to face. So there's an if there. And the problem is that when Christians suffer, they sometimes think that, well, this shouldn't be happening to me. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. Why is this happening to me? Well, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter's written to Christians who, in the time of its writing, were experiencing persecution. And so what he says there, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Notice there's this idea of glory, glorification, joy, suffering, all that goes together. There is no joy in Christ and no glorification in Christ without suffering with Christ. It doesn't mean you have to be on a cross, but is your life being molded by the image of Christ and are you willing to suffer for your faith? I'm reading a book right now entitled Good Faith, and it's written by, um, I've got the names here, David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. Uh, David Kinnaman is the president of the Barna Group, and I think we're all familiar with uh, this Christian polling group that they survey uh, pastors and Christians and society to kind of see what the trends are. And here's what they said in that book. Too many Christians have substituted comfortable living for a life changed by the gospel. Too many Christians substituted comfortable living for a life changed by the gospel. It's more concerned of what's my comfort level. When you go to the doctor, are you in pain? One to ten. We ought to be in pain as Christians. We ought to be making sacrifices. It is expected. It is logical. It is what God expects of us. And so there's too many Christians that 
It's all about what I'm getting out of local congregation, not what I'm investing to the kingdom of God through that local congregation. And there is going to be a big battle. It's already starting in our country where false Christianity and true Christianity are butting heads. And they, and they are very strong in their faith that you know, we as Christians need to stand for our values and that we should not let society dilute those values. My friends, if the church stops speaking the truth, who speaks for the truth? Who speaks for the gospel? Who speaks for God? When you read in 2 Thessalonians about the restraining force, we are the restraining force in our world today. You take the church out of this world, this, this world, you think it's bad now? Oh, it'll be so much worse. So much worse. But the question is, are we using the opportunities that God has given us to let people know about the reality of the gospel? We've all heard of the Titanic. You can go to Pigeon Forge and Sevierville up there and you can see a mock-up of it. It's, it's fascinating. You got to go there after you go by Arby's and get that sandwich I was telling you about. So I don't own any Arby's stock. I'm just, it was just a really good sandwich. So they didn't carry enough life jackets on the uh, Titanic. They said it was unsinkable. And the story is told about uh, John Harper, who was a preacher. He was on his way from England going to Chicago to preach in the Moody Church. And he was uh, in the water, in that cold, frigid water. And he was holding on to a plank, and, and he saw this other young man that was there, and he said, Young man, are you saved? The young man replied, no. Then a wave separated them. A few minutes later, the, the currents brought them back together, and Harper called out, have you made your peace with God? The man said, not yet. And it's reported that not too long after that, John Harper went to the bottom of the ocean. Two weeks later, that young man, appeared in a, he, he survived, he was picked up, and he went to a religious meeting in New York City. And <clears throat> from that point on, from, that, from the time of the, of the shipwreck, those words kept ringing in his ears, are you saved, are you saved? And when he went to that religious meeting two weeks later, he said, I am John Harper's last convert. His last convert. Even in the midst of a shipwreck, John Harper was a witness to the power of Jesus Christ. My friends, you may, you may think, well, my life's a mess and, and look what I'm going through. It doesn't matter. If you will just shine the light into this world, it will make a difference. That's the power of the gospel. And that's the wonderful good news that you and I have the privilege to share. Let's bow in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your holy word and the great challenges that it puts before us. And Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that, that we will know that we're saved. If we're not, Lord, I pray if there's someone who's not saved, I pray that today that they would know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. Lord, help us to embrace the suffering that you've called us to. Help us that we could live a life that shows others the power of your love. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come just as you are is our invitational hymn number 411. If you do not know Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, I encourage you today to, to come and to find the joy of salvation. If you have questions, I would love to talk to you 
about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The Lord may have called you to be a part of our congregation. You've been attending for some time. Please come join us as we serve the Lord together. Let's stand as we sing this hymn together.